introduce uh, the first speaker uh, to kick off this program is Dr. Chris Fries. You all know Chris. Uh, Chris is now the uh, interim director of the liver transplant program. Uh, really has been a wonderful surgeon for more than 20 years at UCSF, now the interim director of liver transplant program and a wonderful leader. So he's going to talk to us about, the, give you an introduction about our liver transplant program. Chris. Well, thank you, Francis. Um, as uh, I've uh, had the experience of having this talk for the last uh, couple of years, I can tell you it's a real, it's a real honor to, to, to provide this uh, overview of our program and highlight uh, uh, all the things that I think we do, do very well at, uh, at UCSF. And again, we appreciate you coming to listen to our, our program. So Francis already uh, showed you our mission, and I think these, these are real, real beliefs. I think uh, we're very, very dedicated to making sure we, we do an outstanding job of taking care of your patients, bringing them through the transplant process, and really maintaining high quality results, and I'll show evidence of that in, in a few minutes. But also staying on the cutting edge, uh, both on the clinical side and on the basic research side, and I think that's probably what excites me the most about our program is the, the up and coming new uh, avenues that we're exploring. So let's go over uh, some results of our program. Um, in the last uh, <clears throat> year in 2017, we actually had another record year, uh, breaking the previous uh, year's record of 186 total transplants, uh, with seven of those being pediatric transplants. Uh, this year, we're annualized to do about uh, 170, which I still think is an absolutely uh, tremendous accomplishment. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're always looking for innovative, innovative ways to do more transplants. I think, uh, you know, consistently being above 150 is a, is a fantastic accomplishment. So I'm, I'm very proud of our program's numbers in that regard. And in terms of the numbers of patients that we take care of, uh, this sh shows a flow of patients over the <clears throat> last year on our waiting list. We had 693 people that started on the waiting list in January of 2017. We had an, another 330 new patients that were added and 332 that were removed uh, to end up with 698 at the end of the year. So we didn't really reduce the waiting list, unfortunately. But uh, those list removals included 180 patients that were transplanted, which obviously is the ultimate goal of the program. Unfortunately, we also had 56 patients who passed away waiting, which is the uh, sort of the, the downside of uh, um, uh, our job is uh, having patients pass away on the waiting list. So that's another goal is to try and minimize that number. In terms of transplant rates, um, we are um, uh, doing about 25 out of 100 people per year uh, receive a transplant. Uh, the national uh, statistic is about 54 out of 100, so we're below that. But if you compare our transplant rate to the other two centers in the Bay Area, we're, we're all about the same. So it's a, it's a function of a very robust lists at each of the programs and, a, again, a fairly limited uh, number of donors. And uh, waitlist mortality rates, uh, despite the great number of patients we're trying to serve, are really not that much different than the national waitlist mortality rates. And I think that's a testimonial to the, to the care that our hepatologists provide and the interface we have with the community physicians in taking care of these patients while they're waiting for a liver. Well, this is probably the slide that we're most proud of, and that's our uh, outcomes in terms of um, uh, uh, survival, and if you look at uh, the period of time that this uh, slide covers, uh, we had a 92.9% uh, uh, survival, which is better than expected. And in fact, there's only five programs in the country that are able to achieve that level of performance. And if you look at deceased donors, we're even uh, higher with our survival at 93.5%. And uh, again, this is in, in the face of doing a very high volume. We are the busiest center with uh, better than expected results. So something we're very proud of. So in terms of some highlights from last year, again, as I, I mentioned, we had a record-breaking year with 186 liver transplants. That was the second busiest volume in the country. Uh, we also uh, have a very robust living donor liver transplant program, also second best in the country. 
And then um, in terms of outcomes, the results I just showed you are not an aberrancy. We've been able to maintain better than expected results since about 2005, which again is a really remarkable accomplishment when you consider how sick our patients are, the limited ex exposure we have to organs, and the volumes of transplants that we're doing. So I'm sure you all are very aware of the MELD system and uh, the uh, disparity across the country in terms of median MELD scores at uh, which patients get transplanted. California, unfortunately, has the highest uh, median MELD scores at transplant. Both coasts really are disadvantaged in that sense. Dr. Hiroshi is going to talk to you a little bit later about some potential changes that may improve that. But again, this is a major challenge that we have is our patients generally have to be sicker to draw livers. So we try and do our part by utilizing as many organs as, as we can. And these are just some plots that show our overall uh, organ acceptance behavior. If you look at the um, uh, solid line in the upper uh, left-hand corner, that's our overall acceptance rate, which is slightly better than the national average. And if you look at specific uh, organ subtypes, namely uh, high-risk donors or DCD donors, we actually do quite a bit better than the national average. So again, an effort to try and get patients transplanted, maybe not using the most uh, optimal organs, but organs that we're still able to use successfully with great outcomes. So the easiest way, in a sense, to um, cut down our weightless mortality is to have a nice controlled situation with living donor liver transplant, and that's been a major focus of our program. Uh, Dr. John Roberts and uh, Dr. Nancy Asher are the two uh, drivers of that program. And again, we've had uh, great success in that regard. Uh, the advantages of living donor liver transplant are obvious. We decrease the potential waiting time. We can increase survival uh, from the time of listing since patients don't have to deteriorate on the wait list. And hopefully we can transplant them before they become critically ill. Uh, it's a semi-elective procedure. In other words, we can schedule it in the light of day. We know when it's going to happen. And we can uh, choose uh, favorable donor uh, characteristics, younger donors, non-fatty livers, short cold ischemia time, which ultimately translate into better outcomes. And we've been a big uh, proponent of using uh, left lobe grafts, which is not uh, necessarily the norm throughout the country. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the uh, yellow bars, that's our left lobe uh, liver transplants versus the blue bars, which are the right lobe. And in general, we're doing more left lobe transplants uh, than right lobes. And the reason for this is it, it diverts a little bit of the, the um, risk away from the donor, since we believe left lobe donation is a little safer than right lobe donation, and shifts that risk a bit to the recipient, since left lobes are smaller pieces of liver and there's the potential for small for size syndrome and its problems uh, developing uh, more commonly in patients that receive left lobes. But through some technical modifications, I think we've really figured out how to use these left lobes optimally. And again, if you look at our uh, UNOS reported data, the uh, graph on the right hand side, the straight line across is sort of uh, if you're below that, you're doing better than expected. Above it, you're doing worse. And then volume is indicated on the, on the uh, x-axis. And you can see we were, in this reporting period, the highest volume center and right smack on where we should be in terms of uh, outcomes. So uh, despite using what other centers would consider a higher risk graft with the left lobes, we're getting excellent results in our living donor program. So this doesn't all happen by chance. I think the other thing that I'm particularly honored uh, uh, to be uh, uh, the leader of this program is, is um, just the uh, amazing collection of people we have uh, that make this happen. So I just want to thank a few people and run through a few people. Of course, there's our hepatology team, uh, Dr. Yao, Dr. Hamid, uh, Dr. Lai, uh, Neil Mehta, uh, Dr. Taro, uh, Dr. Sarkar, Dr. Brandman, Dr. Price. Uh, we've recently had uh, Dr. Sherman uh, join us, and of course, Dr. Peters has been with us for a while. Um, you know, this is really a stellar group. I'm sure you guys uh, have had great interactions with them. They're very, very dedicated, very energetic, very innovative. All the things you'd want to have in, in your team that's uh, on the front end taking care of patients. For those of you that don't know, Dr. Tarot is transitioning uh, to another program, which... Um, 
you know, I've known her since I started here 25 years ago, and uh, I would consider her a real pillar of the program. I don't know that the program will be any worse or better with her, her gone, but it'll, it'll have a little bit different personality, so we'll miss her, and uh, certainly I want to express my great thanks for all the wonderful work she's done over the years, and of course wish her a great success in her new position. And here are our surgeons, uh, which also have all been around for uh, uh, quite a while, at least the eight on the uh, left-hand uh, side of the slide. Dr. Roberts and Dr. Asher uh, were the pillars that really started the liver program, and uh, my executive director pointed out to me that it's now 30 years, that slipped right by me, that we're in our 30th uh, year of uh, being a liver transplant program, quite remarkable. But it was started by those two, and the rest of us all followed. Uh, we do have a new addition, uh, Dr. Uh, Sharif Syed, who's one of our fellows, uh, just joined us in August. So I think we have a, a very a dedicated crew of talented and very experienced surgeons uh, ready to, to do what's needed to take care of your patients. So it's not just the physicians that make this place work. We have uh, unbelievable support from uh, other professionals. Uh, on the pre-transplant side, we have our list of coordinators here, many of whom I'm sure you get to know as you're uh, uh, navigating patients through our system. Uh, again, it's an absolutely stellar team. Um, we have an inpatient team of nurse practitioners who uh, really have uh, stepped up to, to uh, provide uh, um, uh, advanced levels of care to our inpatient team. And of course, this is done with the um, support of our fellows and uh, uh, residents as well. So uh, it's a multidisciplinary team that really works quite well. We also need uh, uh, strong um, uh, support in the outpatient uh, world once patients are transplanted and our advanced uh, practitioners are shown here. Again, they do a fantastic job of uh, maintaining uh, uh, observance of patients' labs, making decisions about when they need interventions, adjusting their medications, and uh, participating in follow-up in clinics. So the patients really get to, to bond with this group of uh, uh, professionals that um, uh, we, we co couldn't survive without them. We do have some dedicated teams for the Living Donor Program um, and also our Hepatitis C Program. Uh, again, these are uh, big enough programs that we need these specialized uh, providers. Um, and then the other ancillary teams that make things work, social work support is incredibly vital, as we'll talk about a little bit later when we, when we debate um, in terms of uh, figuring out the psychosocial issues for our patients, which sometimes can be uh, quite challenging. And uh, the pharmacy uh, support, also a, a key part of any uh, a busy transplant program. These patients have an incredible amount of medications that need to be reviewed and, and uh, 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 taught to the patients, and our pharmacists do a wonderful job doing that, both in the hospital and in the outpatient clinic. And then, of course, all the other little pieces in the hospital that make a complex surgery happen, anesthesia support, uh, operating room staff with uh, special nursing uh, teams for just for liver transplant, outstanding interventional radiology group which uh, bails us out of trouble more more often uh, than than we like to think about sometimes. Uh, our infectious disease group has really built up and become an integral part of uh, patients' evaluations when they come in with problems both pre and post transplant, and they they do a fantastic job. And then, of course, other medical specialists, cardiology and, and, and whatnot. So in terms of new developments, um, I mentioned this last year. We're very interested in, in increasing our non-transplant liver-related procedures. So certainly liver resections for tumors uh, uh, is a growing practice. Uh, Francis didn't mention that we will be starting a new um, uh, hepatocellular cancer clinic, actually just any kind of liver cancer uh, clinic uh, in December. So that's a, a part of our practice that I'm hoping can grow further. Um, we have both expertise in open surgery as well as laparoscopic resections. So if you have patients that you want evaluated, please let us know. Um, I have a big practice in liver cyst disease, um, both simple cyst disease and polycystic liver disease. And then, of course, we're, we're well suited to deal with any biliary tract disease as well. In terms of new programs, uh, the HOPE Act, which allows for HIV-positive donors, 
to donate a deceased donor liver to a, a HIV positive recipient. I think we've done two uh, transplants um, under that act. Uh, PROACT, which allows for hepatitis C positive uh, deceased donors to donate uh, liver to potentially hepatitis C negative recipients and then be treated with the newer hepatitis C drugs post-transplant is a study that um, we've uh, started and I think is opening up another opportunity to get patients transplanted more quickly. Uh, we have our Living Donor Champion Program, which helps to educate donors and uh, recipient families about the importance of living donation and how the process works. I think we mentioned last year uh, uh, an interesting type of swap we did where uh, uh, a um, uh, potential liver, living liver donor couldn't donate their liver because of anatomy and donated a kidney instead. And in exchange, uh, uh, the recipient who got the kidney had a potential donor who couldn't donate their kidney, but donated a piece of liver back to the original uh, index patient. So that was the first swap of that type done in the country and actually won an innovation award uh, through the National Kidney Registry. So we're, we're again, uh, um, always looking for new innovation. I think that really was a shining example. We're very excited about the liver normothermic perfusion, which we'll be starting uh, in 2019 under a study. Uh, so potentially, um, uh, uh, having livers uh, sit on this device, which um, uh, may allow us to transplant some livers that we couldn't use in the past. I mentioned our uh, hepatocellular uh, cancer clinic, which will be starting in 2019. Uh, it'll be a weekly clinic staffed in a multidisciplinary fashion by a surgeon, interventional radiology, hepatology, and oncology. So we're, we're very excited about that development. And all these clinics need room. Uh, finally, we're going to get room. We're going to take over the other half of the floor in the building that we're currently located with our kidney clinic. And uh, this new clinic will be open hopefully by the end of 2019 and will essentially triple our clinic space. So we're ready to, to take on more business. And I just wanted to mention uh, we do have sort of, I call it the mini Silverado meeting down in the Central Valley, and we'll be having that again this year in, in mid-March. Uh, Francis sort of touched on this, the clinics that we have spread out in the outreach uh, world, both pre uh, uh, and post, and uh, we have new clinics opening up in San Mateo for pre-patient care and in Sacramento for both pre and post. So trying to expand our clinic uh, presence to make it a little easier for, for our patients to access our, our care. So that's kind of the state of, state of the union here uh, with our program at UCSF. And again, it's a real honor to, uh, to uh, um, uh, work with all these folks and to serve you and your patients. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the meeting.